Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll also be reading Jude one twenty one. I awakened the other day at 3 o'clock in the morning. The Lord awakened me. When He awakens me, I don't get tired all day. And I awakened thinking about the love of God. The love of God. And um, I was going to start today a series on your focus determines your finish. But I, brought, I want to bring a message on God's love today, and it's appropriate. It's on Valentine's Day. Amen? Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jude chapter 1, verse 21. Jude 1, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice that. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto eternal life. Father, I humble myself before you today and before your precious people, both here and online. I pray you'll pick me up as a microphone. You do the preaching and the teaching today, and we will be ready receivers and doers of your word. And God's people said, Amen. I love to talk about the love of God. You can never exhaust it. I woke up that morning at about 3, 3.30, and these words were going through my mind. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair piled down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned me. From all my sin. Oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels song. And then the second verse is even greater. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were all of the skies a parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Come on, somebody. Oh, love of God. How rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Anybody in the house glad you discovered the love of God in your life? I want to talk to you a minute about what the love of God is not. The love of God is not. Number one, the love of God is not weak. It is strong. 1 Corinthians 13 says that the love of God never fails. Never fails. The only thing on this earth that never fails that I know anything about is the love of God. It is not weak. It is not shy. It is not retiring. It's strong enough to hold us with Him until we see Him face to face. The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. God's love is so strong that life or death nor principality or power or might or dominion, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's certainly not shy. It's not weak. Paul loved the people so much that he never defended himself, and yet he defended the call of God on his life and the apostleship on his life like a lion. Jesus loved the people enough to die on Calvary. But before he did, 
He cleansed the temple. How many know the love of God is not weak? The love of God's strong. It's not shy and it's not retiring. Next, the love of God is not self-seeking. It's not self-seeking. 1 Corinthians 13 says that it does not seek its own. I don't know why I'm preparing this message. I thought of so many songs. But when I thought about the love of God not being self-seeking, these words came to my mind. I work so hard for Jesus. I often boast and say, I've sacrificed a lot of things to walk this narrow way. I gave up fame and fortune. I must be worth a lot to thee. And then I hear him say, Gently to me, I left the throne of glory and counted it but loss. My hands were nailed in anger upon a cruel cross. So now we'll make the journey with your hands safe in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God was not seeking his own love, but he sought me While I was yet in my sin, he loved me. When I had nothing to give him, nothing he needed, nothing he longed for, when I was yet a sinner, God commended his love toward me, and he sent his son. His love is not self-seeking. Number three, his love is not easily offended. Not easily offended. Have you noticed how easy it is for People who say they love you. Now, come on, don't look anywhere. Don't point. Just keep looking right here. But have you ever noticed people that sometimes say they love you? How easy it is for their love to get offended. I saw a quote by Mother Teresa recently, and it said this so true. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you'll win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. Be happy anyway. Give the best you have, and it may never seem enough, but give your best anyway. Listen to this. In the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Isn't that strong? That's so powerful. Brother Mike, I've, I, uh, I've loved people, and they've hurt me, and I've been offended. <laughs> My friend can, uh, how many are grateful God didn't get offended every time we've upset him? Every time we've hurt him? Every time we've messed up somewhere? Come on. The Bible said, keep yourself in the love of God. This isn't automatic. We've got to make a decision. We're going to walk in love, and we're going to keep in the love of God. Next, the love of God is not always appreciated in return. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed sometimes when you love people, they don't love you back? Say, Brother Mike, I came for a positive message. I'm positive. Sometimes you'll love people and they won't love you back. Come on, we're not in the land of Oz here. We're living in the real world. Sometimes it's not appreciated or reciprocated. 1 Corinthians 12, 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. This is really real, folks. I'm going to talk about what the love of God is in a minute, but, you know, it's not always going to be appreciated. Sometimes the people you love the most can hurt you the most. And if we're not careful, when that hurt comes, when it's not reciprocated, love is not returned, in fact, Hatred may be returned for love. And you think, ah, I'm never going to let that happen again. I don't know why. I 
I'm so big on songs today more than usual, but I keep thinking of songs. I think Brother Doug came up against me and walked past me or something, and it just rubbed off. But I keep thinking of these songs, and I wrote it down. There have been times when giving and loving brought pain. Anybody ever been there? And I promised I'll never let that happen again. But I found out that loving was well worth the risk. And even in losing, you win. I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. Get this. I could never, never out love the Lord. Come on, folks. Let's love them anyway. Let's love the people that hurt us. Let's love the people that reject us. He hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lastly, oh, it's not the last part of the message, just point one. The love of God is not based on the worthiness of the recipient. God didn't love us based on our worthiness. Romans 5, 8, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Luke 6, 31, and as you would have men do to you, do you to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love them that love them. And if you could do good to them which do good to you, what thanks have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thanks have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you'll be the children of the highest. How many know that's pretty tough love? Love those that despitefully use you. But let's look for a minute about what God's love is. Y'all still with me? Say amen. The love of God is the DNA of God, and therefore it should be the DNA of His children. It's what God is. If you had to find one word to wrap up what our God is, our God is love. He would never order a a war against unbelievers like some other gods order. He would never order a jihad, but rather he would reach out to his enemies. Come on. Our God, his DNA is love. If you really want to know the love of God's DNA, it's in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And out of that love comes joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Congress in its august wisdom has not found a way to pass laws against any of that. The love of God. It is His DNA. And if it's His DNA... It ought to be ours. First John 4, 16. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Say it out loud with me. God is love. Say it again. God is love. And you can reverse that. Love is God. How many grateful that that DNA is in you as a believer? Next, the love of God is the antidote to fear. The love of God is the antidote to fear. I mentioned this Wednesday night. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear, because fear has torment. He that Feareth is not made perfect in love. 
perfect love cast out fear. Dr. Mike, aren't you afraid, you know, someday it's appointed unto us once to die? I mean, aren't you afraid of death? Well, the book of Hebrews says that if you have the fear of death, you'll be in bondage all your life. Fear does not cancel death, it cancels life. I'm going to let you think about that a minute. Fear does not cancel death. I mean, someday this body's going to die. You say, well, Brother Mike, you're going to die too. Oh, no, I beg to differ with you. The Bible said, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now I'm going to stretch your theology. Come on. Pastor's going to stretch you every once in a while. Brother Mike, it's appointed unto man wants to die. Right, I've done that. It's getting quiet now. I know what some of you are thinking. The first week he's into heresy. No, I'm not. Hang on. Hang on. Didn't Jesus say, he that liveth, are you alive? Say amen. And believeth in me. Do you believe in him? Say amen. Well, the next thing he said, he that liveth, you said amen. And believeth in me, you said amen. And he said, shall never die. Now, you don't think he lied there, do you? No. Well, Brother Mike, your body's going to die. Well, my body's not me. My body is my house. The Bible said I can be absent from my body and present with the Lord. I can't be absent from me, and neither can you. You can't be absent from yourself. You say, but brother mine, aren't you afraid when this body dies? Why should I be? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said, I'm in a straight betwixt two. I have a desire to depart. He didn't say I have a desire to die. He said I have a desire to depart. I've traveled all around the world. I've never been in an airport yet that said death time 205. It says departure time 205. If it said death time, I wouldn't get on the plane. Why do I not fear death? Because I've experienced perfect love. Perfect love casteth out all fear. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's with me while I'm in this body. And when I leave this body, it'll be like a fluid drive transmission. I I won't even feel it shift going into glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't fear. I don't fear when a Democratic donkey's in office. I don't fear when a Republican elephant is in office. I don't fear COVID-19, 2025, or 1900. I do not fear what man can do unto me. Why? I've experienced the love of an all-loving God, and He'll never stop loving me. Hallelujah. The love of God cast out all fear. I say to our online family, don't be afraid. Fear not. This is a grand year. This is a great year for the church of Jesus Christ. Revival will be our revenge for the attack of the enemy. We're going to see people's lives change. Not walking around in fear. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. What's he given us? But of power. And what's next? Of love and of a sound mind. The Greek literally says he has not given us a, spear, a spirit of intimidation or to be timid. But he's given us a spirit of dunamis power and agape love and a self-controlled mind. That's why I'm not watching the Today Show. Oh, I'm going to quit preaching and go to meddling, but it's anointed meddling. I don't sit and listen to all the gloom and the doom and the media nonsense. We're going under. We're not going to make it. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know if they're going to make it, but I'm not going under. I'm going to be more than a conqueror. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. All of my needs are being met according to his riches and glory. The evil one toucheth me not, and no weapon formed against me will prosper. Excuse me. I know it's Sunday morning and there's snow outside, but I got a little fire in my spirit today, and it's time the church says we're walking in the love of God. Hallelujah. I don't know if any of you thought when 
I quit traveling as uh, an apostolic ministry and evangelistic and prophetic ministry and took on the mantle again of a pastor that I was going to simmer down, but I wouldn't hold my breath if I were you. Because the same fire that was in me then is in me now. Next, walking in the love of God for each other is the proof we're followers of Christ. Walking in the love of God for each other is the proof that we're followers of Christ. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you, not a suggestion, a commandment that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples because of the way you love one another. Not because of the books you write, the songs you sing, the buildings you own, the money you have in your account, the wisdom you have. There's only one way the world's going to know that we're followers of Christ. It's because we love one another. Now, come on, let's just get down where the rubber meets the road here. It's easy to love God. Some of you know where I'm going next? I mean, it ought to be easy for anybody to love God. A God that would love us so much that he'd take his only begotten son and send him to die and take our sin on the cross and say, you don't have to sign, join, or buy anything. Just come to me, confess me as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you'll be saved and your sins cancel. It ought to be easy to love that kind of a God but to love some of his children. And <laughs> Jesus didn't say, by the way you love God, will all men know that you're my disciple. He said, by the way you love one another, will all men know. Now, there are seven different motivational gifts in Romans chapter 12. Someday I'll do a teaching on those, but they determine your personality more than environment or heredity. God puts one of those gifts as a major motivation when you were in your mother's womb. That's one reason why God is incensed against abortion. It is not just the taking of a human life. It is the canceling and the dishonoring of a gift that God was trying to send into the earth. And... Uh, my wife's primary motivational gift is mercy. And her secondary gift is exhortation. And I need both. My primary motivational gift is prophetic. My secondary is teaching. Every one of those gifts have a strength and every one of those gifts have a weakness. But the mercy gift... <laughs> Mercy is a great gift and great strength, but it is easily taken advantage of. That's why she married prophetic, because we're not. If somebody calls, remember the telemarketers that would always call at supper time? Always at supper time. And if Miss Mercy picks up, y'all see the look I'm getting. Miss Mercy picks up the phone. And somebody on the other end is, we're saying, oh, you're selling magazines. Oh, you're working your way through college? Well, I don't think we're interested. I'm across the table going. And she's, well, uh, oh, I, really? Oh, that's, oh. You, you, you were the oldest of 12 kids, and you had to work to help your mom. And, uh, oh, this is my sermon. Shh, quick. <laughs> She didn't say all that, but you know what I'm saying. And finally, I'll just say, hey, baby, hand me the phone. And, and I'll take it, and I'll go, hello. Oh you're, oh, you're selling magazines? Really? You're a salesman. I've had some sales training, and they taught us that we had to know the ratios of no's to yes. How many no's does it take to get to a yes? I'm sure you've got that number in your mind, and I'm going to help you get to a yes faster. No. Now, prophetic people aren't cruel people, but we just get to the point.
What are you saying? I'm saying it's easier to love some people than others. You know? It's easy. Sometimes, sometimes we grate on one another. Sometimes just little things we do sometimes are irritating to one another. Well, well, why aren't they in the anointing like I am? Well, they're in their gift. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. Prophetic people have a tendency. Why don't those mercy people get with it? And mercy people are going, I hope he doesn't have a stroke. <laughs> Come on, if it's going to snow, we might as well have a little joy up in here today. And if you're not careful, you say, well, how does that work in your marriage? Beautifully. Because what I don't major in, she has. And what she doesn't major in, I have. So we've learned to honor the strengths of each other. And it makes our love greater. Folks, I want to tell you something. Faith and Wisdom Church, and if you're watching online and you're looking for a church, I can tell you one thing. You come to Faith and Wisdom, we're going to love you until there's no more love. We're going to treat you with honor. We're going to treat you with respect. And if you don't know Jesus, it's going to be our joy to introduce him to you and see your life change. Love. How do, how do people know that we're really following Christ? Because we love one another. Can I hear an amen? Two more. Can you receive it? The love of God holds on and lets go. The love of God holds on and lets go. I believe that scripture that says, The Father that gave you to me is mightier than all, and no man and pluck you out of my hand. I believe that, don't you? As long as I want to stay in the hand of the Father, He's able to keep me. Jude said He is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before His glory with exceeding great joy. Paul said no other creature can separate us from the love of God. I believe that. Now the book of Hebrews seven times says, I can drift away, I can walk away, I can quit believing, but why would I want to do that? I'm going to stay in His hand, amen? But the love of God holds on, and it lets go. Peter and Judas both sinned equally against Jesus. What Judas did in betrayal is no worse than what Peter did in denial. But one came back, and God was able to hold on. The other one rejected, and God turned loose. Now, we've rejoiced, and we'll do it again in a minute before we finish, but folks, I want to tell you something. There is a doctrine being taught today. Now, come on, take a big, deep breath and buckle your seatbelt on this. That the love of God never gives up or turns loose. That's not true. That's not true. The Bible said in the book of Romans chapter 1 that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish hearts were darkened. They changed the glory of an incorruptible God into images of four-footed beasts and creeping things. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, watch this, God gave them over. Then it says, God gave them up. And this is hardly preached today. And that's why there is very little fear of God in our nation. He is not the beneficent Santa Claus in the sky that says you can live like hell and still go to heaven. Come on, y'all, light me up till now. Hang in here. This needs to be taught. This needs to be taught. 
It needs to be spoken to Washington, D.C. It needs to be spoken to Jefferson City. It needs to be spoken to government officials. It needs to be spoken to the American culture. We cannot afford to spit in the eye of a holy God and then claim His love is going to see us through. No, His love holds on, but His love lets go. He will never force us and take away our will. Say, Brother Mike, you seem angry. I am. I'm not angry at people. I'm not angry at my nation. I'm angry at preachers that are only preaching half-truth in the pulpits of America today and not declaring that as much as the love of God wants to hold on, you can't play around with a holy God. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there comes a time, the Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with man. Boy, I didn't know this was going to come out so strong today, but it needs to come out right now in our country. I love my country. I thank God for my country. I'd die for my country tomorrow. I'd go to war for my country tomorrow to protect our liberties. But we've turned our back on God. We have disregarded His Word. And we need to come back to the God who loved us uh, and made us great. And there's only one way we'll ever be great again. And that's return and repentance to a God who loves us and is reaching out to us. Wow. Wow. The father loved the prodigal son, but he let him go. I said the father loved the prodigal son, but he let him go. And someone is watching me online today. You don't even know why you've taken time to do this. But you're a prodigal, and you've walked away from the Lord. I'm not talking about just walking away from church. I'm talking about you've walked away from the Lord. Maybe you were offended. Maybe you were hurt. Maybe it wasn't right. Somebody did you wrong. But you've walked away from the Lord. And you think, I'll still be all right. Listen, my friend. You're going to end up in a pig pen that you don't want to be in. That addiction that once had your life is going to grip you again. Right now, through the word of knowledge, I speak to someone that's watching me online. God set you free. He forgave you. You've been offended. You're walking away from the Lord. And if you don't return, it'll be seven times worse than it was before. And a God of love on Valentine's Day is reaching out to you and saying, come home, come home. I'll still let you in and we'll blot out your sin. Don't go back to the pig pen. Whom the Son of God makes free is free indeed. Come on home in Jesus name is there still hope for america yes we got to come home the church got to come home we're going to have to quit the competition come on I have to quit trying to be relevant to the world when we're not relevant to the kingdom and get back to the blood and the word and the cross and the holy spirit for the Lord is about to return, and He's coming back for those that love Him and are looking for Him. Wow. You know who you are. You just watch me online. Just watch me. Do it today. In fact, I'll stop right now. Father, I pray for that one. I'm watching online right now. There may be more than one, but there is one. And when I spoke those words, you knew it was you. Inside, you felt the Spirit of God drawing you. And I pray for you right now. Come on, church, lift your voice with me. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that addiction cannot hold you. It cannot keep you. Right now, where you are, cry out to God. And as you cry out to Him, He'll make you free. Lord, I failed. I walk away from you, but I'm coming home. And I'm experiencing the love of God. Do it right now in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. I'll give you one more, Doug. Just keep playing. The love of God is the fuel of faith. The love of God is the fuel of faith. I'm a faith man. Anybody in here 
Believe in faith. Operate in faith. Somebody one time came up and said, well, are you one of those word and faith preachers? I said, well, I'm not one of those fear and doubt preachers. I believe in faith. You, you can't be saved without it. You're saved by grace through faith. To every man is given the measure of faith. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So I'm a faith man. But listen to these words. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and though I give my body to be burned, and though I have faith to move mountains, and have not love, it profits me nothing. I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I can have faith. I can have hope. I can speak in other tongues. I can know the Word of God from front to back. But if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. Faith works by love. What is the fuel of faith? The love of God. That's what. Have you ever felt faith run low? When your faith runs low, get in the presence of God and just begin to love Him. Don't come into His presence and say, I just don't have enough faith. I, I just feel so low in faith. Forgive me for not having faith. Don't do that. Just come into His presence and begin to do this. Father, I love You with an undying love. Sometimes I don't even feel your presence. Sometimes I don't know what to do, but I know you're with me always. I love you. I give praise to you. I give love to you. And you know what? As you begin to love God and he begins to love you, it's like pulling up to the gas station of faith and the Holy Spirit will put that pump in your tank and begin to fill you with faith. You didn't even go there to get faith. You just went there to love the Lord. How many know as you operate in love, your faith will be built. There abides faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these three is love. Last scripture. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation. Big word, it means the substitute sacrifice for our sin. I thought of another old song. If you could, uh, if you could own all the world and its money. Build castles tall enough to reach the sky above. But if you've not come face to face with Jesus and His saving grace, you've known nothing until you've known the love of God. Until you know the loving hand that reaches down to fallen man and picks him up from out of sin where he has trod. <laughs> well, until you know just how it feels to know that God is really real, then you've known nothing until you've known the love of God if in your lifetime you could meet everybody, if you could call every name from here to Yah, but if you've not come face to face with Jesus and His saving grace, you've known no one until you know God 
and his love. Until you know the loving hand. <laughs> It'd be okay to worship the Lord a little bit about this. Until you know the loving hand. And you're not falling, brother, but you're here handy. Until you've known the loving hand that reaches down to fallen man and picks him up from out of sin where he is trod. Until you know just how it feels. Thank you, brother. To know that God is really real. Then you've known nothing until you've known the love of God. So on this snowy Valentine's Day, I came by to tell you, again, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. And I remember one time in the lowest of my low, as I close today, and I want you to grab this, one of the lowest times of my life, heartache, heartbroken, worn, weary, I looked up to the Lord and I said, Father, I hope, I hope I've done my best for you. Because that really is part of my DNA. Whatever I do, I want to give God my best. Come on. Can I get a witness in the high? I want to give God my best. And I didn't feel like I, you know, when you compare what God's done for us, and it just doesn't look like, and I said, Lord, I, I've tried to give you my best. I hope it's been my best. And the Father whispered these words to me. He said, Michael, He said, if you've been the only one that ever needed help, ever needed strength, ever needed grace, ever needed being picked up, ever needed forgiveness, ever needed salvation, Jesus said, I would have hung on that cross six hours naked, just for you. If everyone else that was ever born had no need ever for the love of God, I, I would have hung on that cross just for you. So until you've known the loving hand that reaches down to fallen man and picks you up from out of sin where you've trod, until you've known how it feels to really know that God is really real. You've known nothing till you've known God and His love. Hallelujah.